All right, guys, BLM here. We're back with a new video. In this video, I'll be doing a review of Big Brother Canada Season 7. And I know most people didn't like this season, but I gotta say, I kind of like it. While this wasn't the most dynamic season throughout and didn't have the strongest cast in the world, I did find the gameplay fascinating. The entire season lives and dies with the Pretty Boys, and I actually liked the Pretty Boys. I think each member was interesting in their own way. They completely dominated the season from beginning to end, but did it in a messy way. They weren't always coordinated. They weren't always together. But somehow all four of them made it to the final five. And there were so many times where there was so much inner conflict that they should have broken up. I mean, if this was any other lines, they would have broken up over the Corey vote, over the Sam vote. But they never did. And they always seem to get past it. And then we also have three of the four players in the Pretty Boys, I think are some of the best players to ever play Big Brother Canada ever. And possibly even Big Brother in general. But with that said, the overall cast was pretty weak and surprising. Surprisingly so, as Big Brother Canada has always had a really strong cast ever since Big Brother Canada Season 1. And while I do think this cast was strong on paper, it just didn't work out in execution. Now the easiest way I think to go over the entire game is just to do it week by week. So let's do it, let's get started. Starting off with week one, I thought the game started off pretty decently. Obviously we didn't get to see feeds for a first week and we only got two episodes before the first eviction, which is something I wish they would change, but they're not going to. We barely got to see the dynamics from this week outside of Sam and Adam and the Pretty Boys, which seems apt anyway. We did also get to see Damien getting voted in to come in first, which I think was a pointless twist and really in a way it really screwed over Damien as Damien probably would have been part of the pretty boys instead of Mark if he had come in earlier and this could have also been interesting as Damien saw Adam and Dane get together but again it led to nothing we also got to see the secret asset twist which got Corey voted in which like why do they keep on doing this why do they keep on voting in someone on week one like no one cares and it's just a terrible experience for a person that doesn't get voted in I, to be fair i was rooting for Corey during that first week though after the seasons played out i kind of wish i root for holly there was no veto this week which i thought was really good again i think this is something that bear canada should continue doing as long as they continue to do this only two episode first week as that way we get to know more about the characters i mean we did get to see more of laura than we did of like rosina so I do think that's good. And I mean, for abbreviated week, I thought it was fine. Laura gets evicted. She was decent TV. I mean, she had a pretty big presence during those first two episodes. But again, she was out so early that I barely even remember her. And obviously she didn't play well. So whatever. Now for week two, which I thought was fun as well. I think a lot of that came from Mackie's really terrible gameplay. I mean, Kara was going home for the majority of that week. I mean, unless that Sam backdoor plan went into effect, which it never had the opportunity to. But when it was Kira versus Mackie, Kira was going home for the majority of the week. But Mackie would just make mistake after mistake, which caused the vote to flip back and forth, back and forth. And this led to a tied vote at the last minute, which was fun, where Eddie and Damien flipped. Though, obviously, it was all for naught, as Mackie still went home anyway. Yeah, I did feel like this was a fun week. It probably won the best earlier weeks of the season and a lot of that came from Mackie just being a terrible player again I thought he was pretty decent TV I didn't think he was terrible TV but he's quite possibly one of the worst players I've ever seen in Big Brother Canada again he's the type of guy that you would think would be able to fit in socially but he's just so bad at the game that the good players needed him out because he was too sporadic I mean, again like he pretty much actively sent himself home by telling Anthony that he was going to put him up on the block Something else that happened in week two that I forgot to mention was the HOH not playing in veto twist. This new thing that they're trying out. And I'm not really sure what to think of this twist. I think there's multiple things. I think one, it allows the HOH to have less of a target coming into the next week as they won't have the opportunity to win two competitions during a week. But at the same time, I do think a lot of interesting back doors have happened because the HOH won veto. And I feel like at the end of the day, this really benefits the competition beast as their threat level is going to be looked at lower than what they normally are. Like someone like Adam, someone like Dane, who easily could have won the vetoes during their HOH weeks, come out of that week looking like less of a threat because they only won the HOH. That being said, I do think if they were able to compete in those competitions, I think they probably win the majority of them. I mean, Dane and Adam pretty much won the majority of the comps anyway. But overall, with this twist, I'm kind of mixed on it, but I'm not anti it. I'm not that upset that they implemented it. And I wouldn't be upset if they did it for next season as well. Week three was fine. Chelsea had a backdoor plan and it went through. It, it was fine. <laughs> this is probably where the season started to slow down though. I do think there were some interesting dynamics here between the pretty boys. We had Mark plotting to get rid of Dane. We had Dane and Anthony plotting to get rid of Sam behind Adam's back. 
This is also the week that we had the video Intel twist, which is where, once again, Damien got voted in to get Intel on two people. It, it was pointless. Like, it really was. It's like the most pointless thing. It's like, what are we doing? And then Kaylin goes home this week. I thought she was good feeds. Uh, it didn't really translate to the show. She wasn't really shown on the show that much until her final week. But I thought on the feed she was pretty fun. She was very sporadic. She was playing really hard. I think at the end of the day, the thing I'm going to remember her most for is her lying that she's 29, which was funny. I mean, again, like, she's 42, and I think she could have gotten away with, like, 34, 35, but no way is she 29. Then again, I would have said the same thing about Corey, and Corey actually is 29, so, whatever. Now for week four, which was pretty by the numbers. I mean, taking Chelsea out was the right move for the pretty boys, and she pretty much had no shot of saving herself. And then we also had the double eviction during this week, which was also pretty boring. I mean, Eddie got taken out, which was, again, he was pretty much next on the list if Kiki won veto, so, whatever. Chelsea was definitely one of the bigger characters of the pre-merge, though. And she did get a similar style of edit to someone like Hamza, someone like Levita, but I just don't feel like she's as memorable as those people. And I feel like there's other people in her archetype to where I feel like, like, Levita and Hamza, I feel like they're very good chance that they'll be on All-Stars. Chelsea, I'm not entirely sure. For me, she's not super memorable. But again, she did get a really good edit and does seem like production likes her. But I also feel like she played pretty poorly. I mean, she played pretty well for her first couple weeks. But I feel like once she got Kaylin out and then Anthony learned of her, thinking that he's kind of sketchy, I feel like there was just no hope for her. And I, I don't think she played particularly well from that point on. Where it kind of felt like she just gave up. But again, I don't feel like there was a situation out of it anyway. Eddie, on the other hand, I think is someone who had a lot of potential from a gameplay and character standpoint, but didn't live up to it in either. I don't really feel like he had much of an impact on the season entirely. And really, most of the time he would try to play the game, he was actively bad at it. And when he wasn't actively bad, he was just playing super passively. Week 5 picked up a bit here where Sam won HOH, once again ruining Dane and Anthony's plans to get rid of her. But she puts up Mark and Kiki, and this was another week where the vote was flipping back and forth, but didn't really matter, as this was the week with the blood veto. Which was another flop of a twist. I mean, where Kira got it, thank God for that, who was never even going home during this week anyway, and it didn't really affect the results at all. But it's just a terrible twist to begin with. If you don't know, the Blood Veto is a power where you can decide to flip the results of the eviction. So essentially, you're the sole vote to evict, essentially. And I just thought this was a really terrible twist. I mean, this just gives the majority more opportunities to get power. But yeah, Kira has the blood veto, Kiki gets voted out of the game, and Kira has the decision on whether to save her or not. And guess what? She doesn't. And why know the reason why? It's because the pretty boys convinced her not to. Again, coming into this week, Mark was the target. Mark is the person that they wanted to get out between Mark and Kiki, but through talking it through with people like Adam, people like Anthony, they were able to flip the vote onto Kiki. And also part of this is also Kiki's terrible gameplay as well, where she pretty much isolated Kira to the point where Kira wanted to get rid of her. And I guess we might as well just get into it now. Kiki's a terrible player. She was okay TV, I guess. Not really, though. Again, I just felt like she was very underwhelming. There was a point where I was rooting for her. Around week two, I was really rooting for Kiki and Esty. But they were just such flops from a casting perspective. I mean, she's such a terrible player. Again, she would actively put her foot in her mouth. She would also not even fight for the blood veto. And she was just so clueless in the game. Just like most of the cast. Now for week six, which was pretty frustrating to watch as someone who, at this point in the game, I was rooting for Sam. And Adam to a degree. And... Yeah, I mean, Sam gets taken out by Corey, which I think was the wrong choice for Corey. It's not the worst choice for Corey. I don't think this is the worst move ever by any means, but certainly not the best choice for Corey. The frustrating thing here was that Dane and Anthony just like completely duped her. And like the fact that she was so confident they were correct when she just didn't think of the possibility that everyone was lying to her. Again, it's not like one side's lying to her, one side's telling the truth. Both sides are lying to her. So I feel like that was the frustrating thing here. And also her talking about, oh, I'm such a great player and stuff. That was really annoying as well. Now for Sam herself, though, again, I really liked her. I was rooting for her at this point in the game. And while she did make some major mistakes and was also duped by the Pretty Boys, I thought she was probably one of the better players outside of the Pretty Boys. Now for week seven, which was one of the better weeks of the entire game, probably, Mark wins HOH and is pretty close to taking his shot at the Pretty Boys. He wants to go after Adam, but realizes the votes aren't there. But he decides to put up Adam anyway as a pawn and then put up Damien as the target. 
Adam wins veto, and then after that, pretty much becomes a pretty boy civil war, which had already happened earlier in the season when Kiki was on the block, where Kiki was Dane's pawn, Anthony was trying to get rid of Dane's pawn, and he actively did. This was kind of a similar thing, where pretty boys were fighting against each other. Dane and Adam were fighting to get rid of Corey. Anthony wanted to obviously keep Corey, and Anthony won. Anthony wins this fight, and I feel like this is a common trend in this season, where Anthony, while not the best physically, like he doesn't he doesn't win many comps, he's so good socially and strategically, where he's able to get his way despite that. However, this is also the week with the secret assassin twist, which Adam is finally able to find, and he uses it to put up Corey. Now, as a twist, I, I, I don't particularly like this twist, though it did have a great result. I mean, uh, it's pretty much just another version of, like, the MVP. But this did allow for Corey to be put on the block against Esty and Damien, and Corey goes home. Which I felt like was really, really satisfying. And it was nice to see Dane break away from what Anthony wanted for once. Now, for Corey herself, again, I liked her at the beginning of the game. I thought she was fun for the first couple weeks, and then she pretty much just became an Anthony pawn. Would believe anything he said, while thinking she was some sort of mastermind the entire time. Now, for week eight, which was... meh. I mean, SD got blindsided, that that was something. And then we got Damien being taken out in the double eviction, which again was kind of meh. I mean, I feel bad for Damien. I mean, you could tell he was genuinely blindsided. Just his reactions on his face, I thought were pretty sad to see. But, um, again, he just didn't play well. And also, I think this was a bad move for Dane. I mean, Dane was pretty much a key figure in getting both these people out, despite them being his two side pieces. For him to come into the final seven with two side pieces and get rid of them both back to back, I feel like that was a pretty bad move for him. However, obviously, it does work out in his favor later on, but... From a positioning standpoint, I do think it is a mistake. Now for the players themselves, Esty was pretty bad. Again, I think she's a better player than Kiki. I mean, I think she's more socially aware. She's more socially uh, adept, but she just still isn't great. Again, she was pretty clueless throughout most of the season. She was able to do some good campaigning at points. The problem with her is that obviously she didn't know she needed to do campaigning at the final seven. And because of that, she just went out in a whimper, not really knowing she had any shot of going home. Damien was kind of boring. But I still really liked him. I thought he seemed like a really cool guy. And he was good socially, but he just didn't really do anything in the game. He never really had the power to do anything in the game. And he just ran out of runway where he just had nothing he could do. The final five, this is probably the craziest week of the game. And the pretty boys here were four of the final five. The only person that was not a pretty boy left in the game was Kira. And Kira wins. H-O-H. Leaving the pretty boys kind of screwed here. Obviously, one of them had to go. Which, to be honest, I felt like was pretty disappointing. I personally wanted the pretty boys to make it to Final Four at this point. I feel like if they did, they would be easily the best alliance of all time. But to be fair, I mean, I don't think all of them were actually going to do that. I do feel like Mark and Anthony probably would have taken their shot at Adam here if they had the opportunity. While I do think both Dane and Adam would have stuck true to the Final Four deal. But it didn't matter. Kira won HOH. They put up Adam and Dane, which I think is possibly the right move. I think her best chance here is getting rid of Dane. 100% get rid of Dane. She's in the final four with Mark, someone she can beat. Anthony, someone who she has a good relationship with and possibly could take her to the end if he were to ever win anything, which he won't. And then Adam, someone who she has a really good relationship with. And putting Adam and Dane on the block secures that Dane will more than likely be going home you would think. The problem was she didn't let Adam know this. She should have let Adam know so that he doesn't get pissed off. Instead, they get into a big argument and it's pretty much an unrepairable relationship at that point where they never get back together ever again. But obviously, Adam wins veto and uh, this is where it takes a turn. This is why I think this is the best week in the game. Dane. Dane is able to go to Anthony. Anthony straight up tells him, I'm probably going to vote you out. And it seems like Dane gave up. I mean, during that night, it seemed like he gave up. The next morning, though, he goes back to Anthony, shows him his study guide, does this really passionate plea to stay in the game, and it works. He convinces Anthony to keep him, which I think it was the right move for Anthony as well, especially with him thinking that he can win no matter who he's up against. For him, he's just trying to get to the end. And... I think he has a better shot of getting to the end with Dane over Mark, where Mark is very clearly going to take Kira to the end. So I do think this was the right move for Anthony. So then obviously Adam uses the veto, puts up Mark, and then we get a 2-0 to zero vote voting out Mark, which was a really fun vote. And what was really fun about this too is that Anthony was able to 
manipulate Kira this entire week. Again, he's the one that manipulated Kira into putting up Adam and Dane. He also could manipulate her into thinking that getting rid of Mark was good for her game when it was terrible. That was her only chance of winning the game and she just throws it away. It's like, it's mind blowing to me, like how bad Kira is at the game and also how great Anthony is at manipulation. But yeah, as I said, Mark goes home this week and Mark was definitely my least favorite member of the Pretty Boys. I think he was the worst player of the bunch and I think if he wasn't in the Pretty Boys, he would have been taken out much, much earlier. So I do think it was very fitting that he was the first Pretty Boy to go, which kept all three of the best players of the season still in the game. Now we're moving on to the final four round, which was kind of predictable. At this point, Dane and Anthony had co the complete control over the game. They were in the center of the game, and either Adam or Kira were going out pretty much no matter what. And I felt like if Adam was on the block at the very end of this week, if he didn't win HOH or Veto, he was going home. And I was right. Sadly, sadly, I was right. But I do think he put up more of a fight than I thought he would. I thought he made a really compelling argument. One that I think Anthony should have at least thought about more. Now for Adam himself, I'm so happy I was wrong about him. I thought he was a very strong player. He was good enough socially. He was obviously fantastic physically winning a whole bunch of competitions. And he was fine strategically. And obviously he's the one that got the pretty boys together. I do think he has a very good chance of winning the game if he got to the end of the game. Especially against anyone other than Dane. And that's a lot coming from someone who I thought was going to be like the Andrew from BB Can 2 or the Greg from BB Can 3. But he was much more than that. Even though I do think he is still the weakest player of the three remaining pretty boys, I do think both Dane and Anthony played stronger games than him. Again, there were more opportunities for Adam to go home earlier in the game. He was in a mediocre position throughout multiple parts of the game. And then also the fact that he just loses control at the end there, where he loses control of Kira. He didn't play a perfect game, but I do think he's still one of the best players ever played Big Brother Canada. And now we get to the final three, where Dane wins final HOH and votes out Kira. And for Dane, it didn't matter. I mean, it became very clear to this point that through jury videos and everything, he was winning the game. He was going to win the game no matter who he was up against. And this leads to Dane winning unanimously. And I think rightfully so. I do think it's very close between Dane and Anthony and who's the better player of the two pretty boys. So now for the actual members of the final three, we got Kira, who I thought was a pretty bad player. I, I, I think she's an actively bad player throughout. She's someone who I do think has the mind for the game. I think she knows the game well enough to do well. It's just that she can't execute on anything. She was someone who was so frustrating to watch too because she always thought of herself as a great player by her actively being manipulated over and over and over again, especially in the end game where Anthony pretty much controlled her entire game to the point where she thought bringing Dane to the end was good for her game because Anthony was telling her that Dane can't win just to manipulate her into keeping Dane. But thankfully, after watching the jury videos, obviously it became super clear she wasn't going to win. I was actually worried at a point that she might win in a bitter jury against Dane, but obviously it became clear that that was never going to happen. So thank God for that. And obviously it didn't really matter as she got voted out anyway. Anthony played a great game. I think Anthony is one of the best players to ever play Big Brother Canada, played one of the most dominant games in the history of the show, but wasn't rewarded for it. And I think the reason for that is, again, I don't f feel like people saw his game. Kind of similar to Godfrey, though, I mean, Anthony played a much more dominant game than Godfrey. I just feel like people didn't know what he was doing. He was so good at manipulation that people didn't see it as manipulation. And the people that did see it didn't come into the jury a advocating for him. People like Mark, people like Adam. So while he does lose against Dane, I do think that he still played a very strong game. And I feel like if he had more game knowledge, he could have won this game in a completely dominant fashion to where I think if he had won, there is a debate for him being the best winner of all time. The only time he completely lost control was during the Corey week. And that was due to a twist. And he was able to rebound from that and play extremely well from that point on. I do find what Anthony did to be more impressive than something like Adam. And then we got Dane, who I think is one of the best players to ever play the game. I think him winning this season, I think there's serious debate for him being one of the best Big Brother players to ever play the game. I do think he's easily the best Big Brother Canada player. I do think he's easily the best Big Brother Canada winner. I do think he's up there in terms of U.S. Big Brother as well. Again, he played such a dominant game. I think the one deteriorating fact from Dane is the fact that he didn't always get his way. Unlike someone like Derek, who literally got his way the entire game, I do feel like Dane didn't get his way during certain weeks. Again, his pawns were taken out at weeks that he didn't want them to go home. 
But I feel like Dane just plays such a dominant game. Again, not even just physically. Again, he won a lot of competitions, but he was so well positioned. And this is something that I feel like puts him in debate with Anthony. Like, again, for me, while Anthony dominated the game from a strategic level, I feel like Dane was better positioned throughout the game. There were points where Anthony could have possibly went home, especially that first double eviction. He could have possibly went home there. But there's literally no point in the game where Dane goes home. Again, obviously, he could have possibly went home at that final five where he was able to pull out the miraculous thing where he convinces Anthony to keep him. But before that, there was literally no time he would have gone home. No matter who he was up against on the block, he would have stayed. He would have had the votes of Esty. He would have had the vote of Kiki. He would have had the vote of Damien. would have had the vote of Anthony. Most of the times, that was enough. And through Anthony, he would have Corey. Like, there's literally no possibility of him going home until that final five position. And again, I said this earlier. I do think it was a bad move to get rid of Damien and Esty as that did weaken his positioning. But from that point on, he didn't really need it. After he convinces Anthony, he's guaranteed at least final three and more than likely even final two. I think Dane played one of the most dominant games we've ever seen. And to be honest, him t- whoever he took to the end, it didn't really matter. Again, it didn't matter. He was winning against both of them. It didn't matter. And he was so good at making his game known to the jury. Again, we had these jury videos that came out before the season ended where they were talking about Adam and Dane. Adam and Dane were two front runners to win the game. Despite, again, Anthony playing a very strong game. It's just that people didn't know about his game. So I do think Dane as a winner, he's up there. Again, he's definitely number one Big Brother Canada. Where is he in terms of overall Big Brother? He's pretty high up there. I think he's probably in that top tier. But uh, I'll do a video on Big Brother winners in the future. I'll talk more about this. But I think he's definitely up there. So, all right, so that's the entire cast. That's the entire rundown of the game. Now let's talk about some other things. So there's the editing, which I thought was pretty strong for this season, especially compared to Big Brother Canada's 4, 5, and 6, which I thought were particularly bad. I mean, 6 was really bad. But I thought this one was pretty good. Again, I think because there was a lower level of gameplay, there were only a couple people playing really well. Unlike Big Brother Canada 6, where there were so many different plans going around, it felt like the editors didn't know what to do with it. Here, they were able to tell a concrete story again to Pretty Boys. They dominated the game. That's pretty much all they had to tell, and I feel like they did a pretty good job at doing that. Now, for where the season ranks in my personal rankings, it is pretty low. I mean, I do enjoy this season. I I definitely don't hate this season. There's a lot of people that do. I really enjoyed this season, but I think it is still the worst Big Brother Canada season. I, I still think it's below Big Brother Canada 1, so I mean, I think it is the worst Big Brother Canada season. I, at least Big Brother Canada 1 had a very memorable cast. Had some really great moments. I don't feel like this season necessarily has that. Again, it has some of the best players to ever play the game. I don't know if it has the best cast, though. In terms of comparing it to Big Brother US, I mean, I think it's towards the bottom as well. I think it's probably right below Big Brother 12. So yeah, it is, it's still relatively low, but it's not the worst season in the world. But there you go. That's pretty much everything I got to say about Big Brother Canada 7. And again, as I said, I, I don't think this is a bad season. I thought it was a fun season. Again, it didn't have some boring parts, yeah, but overall I thought it was a pretty fun ride. So yeah, that's it for the video. Thank you for watching.